Welcome to Highlight Lecture Number One. Voyager explores the final frontier of the solar system. I think most of us know uh, Dr. Ed Stone uh, as president of the International Academy of Astronautics and um, a long associated with the IACs. But there are probably fewer of you uh, who know him uh, as um, uh, the ex-head of Jet Propulsion Laboratories. And it's for those of us who knew him at that time period, it was remarkable that a principal investigator could continue his scientific work at the same time as he managed a highly diverse, um, uh, explosively growing uh, uh, activity such as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was. But do it he did. And for 34 years, Ed was principal investigator of the Voyager as it explores the final frontier of our solar system. I rather suspect no one knows Ed's title right now. But Dr. Ed Stone, and I have to look, is the David Morris Rowe Professor of Physics at the California Institute of Technology. Ed, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Dick. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and talk about a really wonderful journey of exploration that's uh, been underway now since 1977. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, final frontier that Voyager is now exploring. Uh, let's start with the spacecraft itself. I guess I don't have a pointer after all. Dick, did you say you had one? Uh, the, uh, this is the Voyager, two Voyager spacecraft. Uh, the uh, radio antenna is, uh, uh, is a 12-foot diameter antenna. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So it gives you a sense of scale. Uh, and the, uh, the boom with the two magnetometers on it is a 13-meter boom. Uh, the, these two 10-meter uh, antennas are part of the plasma wave investigation, which uh, measures the waves in the plasma. It also measures very low-frequency radio waves coming from uh, the interstellar space. Uh, the, uh, and the other three currently operating instruments is this is the solar wind instrument, which is operating on Voyager 2, not Voyager 1. Uh, the, uh, this instrument right here is the low-energy charge particle instrument and the cosmic ray instrument. So these are the particle instruments covering uh, the range of different energies. The scan platform instruments, uh, of course, the scan platform has been shut down after the planetary encounters, although we do continue to take uh, ultraviolet data uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the outer heliosphere. The spacecraft has its long life uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them is uh, the plutonium-238 power supply, which, of course, uh, has an 89-year half-life, so it gives us a very long uh, life battery and very robust, and uh, so it uh, gives us a very long journey. Now, it all began in 1977. Actually, we started working on the mission in 1972 to get ready, uh, and this is a once-in-every-176-year opportunity when all four of the giant outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are all on the same side of the sun, and a single spacecraft can fly by all four, once every 176 years. And there was a window that opened around 1976 and closed around 1979. Uh, we went in 1977 with the mission. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the... Uh, Voyager 1, uh, this was a, initially a mission to, a four-year mission to Saturn. That's the way Voyager started, a four-year mission to Saturn. That was our, our success criteria was one spacecraft making it to Saturn and flying by Titan to measure its atmosphere and flying behind Saturn's rings. That's what Voyager 1 did. And because Saturn was inclined like this, the ring plane was inclined like this at the time, when we flew behind the ring plane, we ended up going up at 35 degrees out of the ecliptic plane. No more planets. But the success of Voyager 1 in November of 80 and doing the two prime uh, things at Saturn, rings and Titan, that could not be done except with this kind of trajectory, allowed us to uh, leave Voyager 2 in the plane of the planets 
not do Titan and not do the rings, but head off to Uranus. And at that time, we shifted from a four-year mission to Saturn. We added another five years, and the mission was then called the Voyager Uranus Interstellar Mission, because, of course, that's the mission the Voyager 1 was already on back in 1980. Uh, Successful uh, Uranus encounter in January of 86, and another mission extension. The mission is then renamed the Voyager Neptune Interstellar Mission. And finally, in 1989, it became just the Voyager Interstellar Mission, which it has been now for quite a few years. So that's the 12 year journey to the planets, uh, which now has been extended, uh, uh, well, 29 years going on, a total of 29 going on 30 years uh, where we are today. Now, this is a, it's more than an interesting trick to get, say, to four planets uh, with a single spacecraft. It turns out it was an essential part of getting there. Uh, this is the speed of the spacecraft as a function of distance from the sun. And uh, as you can see, when we launched it, the dashed line, by the way, is escape velocity at that distance. So you can see when we launched from Earth with, the, with this was a, about an 800 kilogram spacecraft. When we launched from Earth with a Titan III Centaur, which is a pretty good sized launch vehicle in those days, not of course a uh, Apollo sized launch vehicle, but a good good sized launch vehicle. We did not have escape velocity, as you can see. The spacecraft slowed down as it moved away from the Sun until it got to Jupiter, and then thanks to Jupiter's orbital motion, which just slingshotted Voyager on we gained as much energy when we flew by Jupiter as we had gotten from that big launch vehicle in Florida, and we didn't have to carry it with us. That was a big advantage. Uh, and we then had escape velocity. In fact, we could not have made it to Saturn if we had not flown by Neptune, by, by Jupiter. But then Saturn gave us another boost, as you can see. Uranus gave us another, this is Voyager 2, another small boost. And we chose to fly by Neptune in a certain way to, so we could go past Triton, the moon of Neptune, and we actually gave up a little speed. Voyager 1 just had a Jupiter and Saturn, and it's actually moving faster than Voyager 2 is, just about 10% faster. So it was not only a great way to do four with one spacecraft, it was an essential way to have the energy that was needed to get uh, out into the outer solar system that quickly, 12 years from launch to Neptune been a 30-year mission if it had been a strictly a ballistic trajectory from Earth. Well, here are the four giant outer planets uh, and to scale the Earth. And so you can see that this is a whole new class of planets that we were going to fly by. Uh, Pioneer had 10 and 11 had flown by both of these before Voyager got there. But these were a new class of planet, uh, no solid surface at all, huge spheres, of fluid, gas and liquid, and even the rocky material, an icy material, which is presumably deep in the core of these planets, is melted because the temperature is so high. So these are uh, totally different class of planet that we were headed out to, to explore. for the. Uh, and of course, there were many discoveries. The one hallmark of the Voyager mission has been uh, the unexpected discoveries. Uh, you often plan missions where you think you, you plan to discover things. This is a mission where the things we discovered, we had no idea were there to be discovered. Uh, we knew about the great red spot. Uh, it's a great, we turned, found out, we, it's a great uh, hurricane-like storm system about three Earths across. This white oval is a smaller hurricane storm. There were three white ovals in 1979. Uh, today there's just one. It's, they've merged and it's now red like the Great Red Spot. But the point is, the Great Red Spot was literally just the largest of literally dozens of storm systems which riddle the atmosphere of, of, of Jupiter. And it's these smaller storms, which are small on Jupiter's scale, but large on Earth-based scale, uh, which in fact feed the Great Red Spot and keep it alive for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now. Besides the wonderful atmospheric dynamics of Jupiter that we, we managed to study, we also, of course, looked at uh, the, the moons, the big moons of Jupiter, uh, Jup Io and Europa. We already knew from Earth-based data that they had these colors. That was not the surprise. The surprise was what these things looked like. When we saw Io, we had no idea what we were looking at. We had never seen anything like that before, and in fact, we have seen nothing like it since. It is really a, a really a bizarre object. 
Uh, and of course, it was just a few days uh, uh, as we uh, as we were turning the cameras around to do some navigation that it was discovered the reason it looks so different was because it had a hundred has a hundred times more volcanic activity than Earth. Now this is a moon, a small moon, and it has 100 times more volcanic activity than Earth. That's the reason there are no impact craters. They have been covered up. Uh, and these black things you see are, in fact, volcanic calderas. Every one, there are 100, over 100 of these objects on the surface of Io. It is remarkably a, a world that's turned itself inside out over and over and over. Uh, on to Europa, which is about the same size. They're, both of these are rocky objects, although unlike Io, which has been dried out by all the heat, Europa managed to retain its icy crust. Uh, it turns out that the pattern you see here is, has essentially no relief. It's essentially uh, cracks, if you like, in an ice coated, probably an ice crust on a liquid water ocean, or at least on a, a material which has a lot of liquid flow in it beneath. And of course, the Galileo mission has gone back now and in orbit gotten images 100 times better than this, and in fact has revealed it, this indeed has ice flows, frozen ice flows on its surface, suggesting indeed there is a liquid water ocean, or at least a liquid water beneath the solid frozen icy crust, which is cracked by the same tidal processes which heat and uh, melt Io itself. On to Saturn. I really love this image because it's the first time we had the capability to fly by Saturn and look back. And you can see we're now behind Saturn because we can see the shadow behind Saturn. It was, again, one of those milestones of getting beyond Saturn. But, of course, Voyager 1 is headed up out of the plane, so we're looking down on this is a Voyager 1 image looking down on Saturn as we headed out on our long journey to interstellar space. Uh, this is Enceladus. This is another class moon, much smaller than the large moons at Jupiter. These are measured in hundreds of kilometers. We expected them to be heavily cratered like part of Enceladus is, but it's clearly had a great deal of thermal evolvement. It, it, after a heavy cratering period. Uh, and in fact, if you looked at this by eye, it would be snow white. It reflects essentially 100 percent, essentially 100 percent of the sunlight. This is a very fresh surface. You can even see what look like fault systems down here. So this part of Europa has clearly been uh, recovered, has been covered by uh, reasonably recent, geologically recent. Well, what the Cassini mission has showed us, that is, in fact, there is a huge eruption going on now in the South Polar region, uh, which is creating a not this uh, smooth surface and also a ring of very fine particles called the E-ring uh, as, as Enceladus orbits Saturn. Again, something we could not have imagined. Uh, we expected when we launched this mission that we would see moons that looked like that all over. And that's not what we found. And of course, Titan. We knew Titan, which is about the size of the planet Mercury. Unlike Mercury, it's half water ice and half rock, but it's very cold. So the water ice is rock hard. Uh, but this has an atmosphere. And when we, as from the Earth, when you measure the diameter of, uh, of Titan, you measure the atmosphere, and it turns out it's larger than the planet Mercury. We actually found out, though, that what we're looking at is a very dense haze layer that's created in the atmosphere, and that haze layer is hundreds of miles above uh, the surface, so the actual moon itself is smaller uh, than Mercury, not rather than larger, just a bit smaller. And that the atmosphere is uh, 1.5 atmospheres of nitrogen, much like here on Earth. Unlike Earth, where we have oxygen, which has evolved from life, uh, there's methane, natural gas, uh, which is being converted by radiation into complex organic materials. And it's the larger polymers of those organic materials which create this opaque haze that we cannot see through in visible light. And, of course, the Huygens probe, uh, immediately after our flyby, there was planning started for Cassini in the early 80s, and that resulted in the wonderful landing of the Huygens probe uh, into the atmosphere uh, and to the surface of Titan and the wonderful radar images now which show us there indeed are lakes 
of liquid methane in the polar regions on this world. So in this world, ice is the rock and methane, liquid natural gas, is the water. That's the way it works. And it's a very interesting world which may have something important to teach us about the atmosphere uh, chemistry that occurred early in the Earth's history, before life. On to Uranus, 19 times as far from the sun as the Earth. Saturn was five, Jupiter was, I mean, Saturn was 10, Jupiter was five, 19, tipped on its side. This is a color enhanced version so you can see that there are some subtle color variations. This is the polar region. It was, it's tipped on its side. And at this time of Uranus's 84 year period around the sun, the pole was basically facing the sun 20, well, for its, every hour of its day, if you like. That pole and the other pole was dark. And yet we found the temperature of the two poles to be the same, even though one was receiving sunlight and the other was not. Again, an important message about the internal atmospheric dynamics. And this planet had another big surprise for us. Uh, every planet we had visited till then, like the Earth, the magnetic pole is up near the rotation axis of the Earth because, it, in fact, the concept is the rotation of the planet creates fluid flow deep in its interior. And if that fluid is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, has, is electrically, not electrically neutral, uh, in fact, it will create a, uh, a dyna, create a magnetic field, and that magnetic field will have its axis more or less aligned with the rotation axis of the planet. That was the theory. We found the magnetic pole of Uranus down here at about 30 degrees latitude. Neptune was the same way. So again, a total surprise. Fundamental theorems suggested this shouldn't be this way, but nature obviously finds a way to do it, and that's what makes exploration so wonderful. It tests your ideas, and when you find something you don't understand, there's something to learn. This is a small moon. It's a mere 500 kilometers across. It should have frozen and died geologically. It should have been full, heavily cratered. This is one of the most complex surfaces we've seen. Yet it, it's just remarkable. A little tiny world that should have cooled off very rapidly did not. And there is a cliff that you can see here in this image, uh, which is some 10 to 20 kilometers high on a moon that's only 500 kilometers across. So this has had a very tortured geologic past and has suggested that maybe these inner moons are not the ones we're seeing today are not the ones which were there and formed first, but those were broken up and reformed and then broken up and reformed until finally there were no lo longer any large objects left and the moon we see is the one that survived that era of heavy bombardment. On to Neptune. 30 times as far from the sun as the Earth. The sunlight out here is one nine hundredth of what it is on Earth. Uh, and yet the winds in this atmosphere are the fastest we found in the solar system. Less energy to drive winds, faster winds. Just counterintuitive, at least when you first think about it. Great dark spot, which has since disappeared. It's not like a great red spot. There aren't other spots feeding it. Uh, uh, but very, very fast winds. And the last object that we visited on our way out of the solar system was the moon Triton, which is a captured object. It's about the same size as Pluto. It probably was originally a sibling of Pluto in the Kuiper belt, uh, but it had, it actually got too close to uh, Neptune and, uh, and got captured. Uh, but it gets captured into a very elongated orbit Today, it's in a circular orbit. Where did all that energy go? All that energy it had in its orbit melted this moon. And what you see today, this cantaloupe terrain, the faults are all left from that era when this moon was heated uh, as it tidally uh, uh, slowly, slowly evolved into a circular orbit. Now, this is the coldest object we've visited in the solar system, 40 degrees above absolute zero. So this polar cap is not water ice. This is the water ice covered with an organic residue. This polar cap is frozen nitrogen because at that temperature, nitrogen freezes. Yet you see these dark patches. We discovered that those dark patches are the result 
of geysers erupting from this polar cap at 40 degrees above absolute zero. So every place we looked, we saw things that we could not have imagined, and that's continuing now as we head on to, uh, to the next phase of the mission, the interstellar phase. So what's out there? Well, we heard this morning about bubbles. We saw bubbles. This is the biggest bubble in the solar system. Uh, we had no idea how big it was until just a few a couple of years ago. It's probably about 20 billion American billion kilometers from the sun. Today, Voyager 1 is at 15 billion kilometers from the sun, right about where it's shown here. The sun has a wind blowing radially outward from it, supersonically, in all directions, at, a, at about 400 kilometers per second, creating this bubble around the sun, which is deformed into this comet-like shape by an interstellar wind, which is coming from this direction and deforms the bubble into this long uh, comet-like shape. So where does it all start? It all starts with the sun, the solar wind, uh, Starts with our sun. This is a Soho image of uh, lots of sunspots. The sunspots are the way, uh, the mechanism, part of the process by which the solar magnetic field reverses itself every 11 years. And it's the eruption of the sunspots which are part of this 11-year cycle of activity. Uh, but it's this is the visible part of the sun. Uh, this is not, uh, this, this is uh, uh, only 5,000 Kelvin. Uh, if we look at this is the 11 year cycle of sunspots. We've just gone through the solar maximum in the year 2000 and as now we're approaching again a solar minimum condition where there are a minimum number of sunspots. That's an important part of the size of this bubble because the size of the bubble depends on how strong the solar wind is and that varies over the 11 year cycle. And so the size of the bubble varies. If we move a little bit up in temperature into the corona itself, again a Soho image, one can begin to see the source of the energy which cr uh, creates this supersonic 400 kilometer per second wind. And that's the magnetic fields which you can see changing continuously uh, and it's that change and the, and the uh, annihilation, conversion of magnetic energy into thermal energy which ultimately, as you can see from this, ultimately is the source of energy which then powers uh, the supersonic wind. This is a very active region, as you can see, a very active time, solar maximum. You can see lots of very active regions. Uh, if we now look a little further out uh, with Soho, this small white circle is the size of the sun, which is hidden behind an occulting disk. So what we're seeing now is scattered sunlight that's scattered from the corona, the electrons in the corona itself. And you can already in this image see the radial profile of this wind uh, blowing radially outward in all directions. Uh, and sorry, uh, let me just show you, though, how dramatic this. This is a solar maximum uh, period again. Uh, and so we'll find. Uh, there's a comet, a weather vane, a, a windsock, which is telling us that's the way it was known before the space age that there had to be a wind from the sun uh, because the tails were blowing uh, radially away from the sun. But notice, you can clearly see now in these images the outward motion of the, of the solar wind and on, on top of it, these occasional coronal mass ejections where there's a massive eruption on the sun uh, which will blast out and if, if those are headed toward Earth, when they arrive at Earth in a few days, they create auroras at very low latitudes. They can disrupt power lines uh, uh, in the northern latitudes. And the energetic particles associated with these blast waves uh, can uh, damage satellites. So these, this is solar weather is a very important factor uh, for, uh, for the Earth. But this process extends right out to the very limits where Voyager is. Uh, and I'll come back to the importance of these blast waves in a moment or two. So this is a period of solar maximum when, of course, the sun's most active and the blast, these big blasts are, in fact, uh, most, uh, most abundant. Now, those were all real images. This next thing is a cartoon. It's a flight now starting with the sun, zooming out through the solar system. Uh, and as we do, we'll fly by the inner planets, the rocky inner planets, including the Earth itself, 
uh, in its moon, on out past, and you can now see in this schematic, you can see the uh, representation of the supersonic wind. Now, the wind, because it's supersonic, goes through a shock before it slows down. It can't just gradually slow down. It slows down in a sonic shock. It's called the termination shock of the supersonic solar wind. And at that point, the wind can turn around and go down the tail. And there is a contact surface between the wind from the sun and the wind from interstellar space. That contact surface is called the heliopause. That's the, that's the outer frontier of our solar system in that sense. It's the outer surface of this bubble of solar material. Outside this bubble, outside this surface, the material has come from other stars. Inside the surface, the material comes from our sun. So it's a major transition uh, once we cross uh, into interstellar space. Now, let's zoom in it from great distance out to give you a sense. Of, this thing is immense, this heliosphere, but let's look at it on a galactic scale. This is now, again, a cartoon showing the arms in the galaxy. We'll zoom in to the Orion arm, uh, and we'll zoom in, and you'll get a sense that on a galactic scale, of course, our little heliosphere is a tiny little object. Uh, and since there's a wind coming from this direction, there is probably a shock in front as well, as well as the shock inside. So there are two sonic shocks, one inside where the supersonic solar wind slows down and one on the outside where the supersonic interstellar wind, supersonic in this case is only 25 kilometers per second, uh, also shocks. So that's a cartoon. Now, this is now a, a drawing, an artist sketch of what we think the solar neighborhood actually looks like. Obviously, this is just a representation of, of data that's taken. What's, what the astronomers do is they sit on the Earth and they look at stars and they look at the absorption of ultraviolet light in these different directions. And by looking at absorption, they can say there's a cloud. And what they see is that there is a, an association of massive stars which blew up about five million years ago. It's called the Scorpius Centaurus Association. And when these stars blow up, they expel most of their mass and create clouds of material, which then move slowly through interstellar space. And the sun has just, within the last 100,000 years or so, been enveloped by one of these clouds. So we're in what's called the local interstellar cloud. Uh, and uh, it's, it compresses the heliosphere because it's somewhat denser. Now, all of this is a better vacuum than anything here on Earth, but given the scale, it's still a, a sensible amount of material. Now, it turns out that the, the uh, sun is moving relative to its neighbors in the direction shown by that arrow. The galactic center, which everything is orbiting around, is up in this direction. The cloud itself is moving in that direction. So you add those two directions together. Uh, it's like flying an airplane in the wind. You have to sort of you know, fly it at an angle. Well, in this case, the angle, the wind appears to be coming at, is almost from the galactic center. It's not clearly coming from the center. It's coming from this cloud that's really very local. But the direction is look to the galactic center, and that's where the wind appears to be coming from. We were very fortunate that... It's just once in every 176 years that the four planets were lined up on the side of the sun, which was upwind. So we are going up toward the nose. We could have been going down the tail, and I would have much less of a story to tell you. Okay, are these things really out there? Well, this is an, a, a Hubble image uh, of a star formation region, the Orion Nebula. There is the bow shock in front of an astrosphere, uh, which is around this star. So there's an interstellar wind, and it forms a shock. We cannot see the internal shock. It's all invisible, only the external shock. There is a big bow shock in front of this object. So we know there's a big object there because that bow shock is so big. It's not just a little star. It's got a big bubble around it. There's another one up there. They really are out there. Now, uh, I can't give you, show you a picture of our uh, heliosphere. Unfortunately, it's invisible, but I can show you a picture of my kitchen sink. Well, what's wrong with that? 
You probably have noticed, this is true in any sink, but it's easiest to see in a kitchen sink because you can turn the faucet so the water hits the bottom of the sink. Leave the drain open. You probably notice the thick ring forms when you do that. And inside the ring, inside the ring, the water is thin and fast. It's supersonic. Now, it's really not sonic waves. It's gravity waves on the surface of the water. But the concept is the same. The water is moving too fast, so it just continues to expand. But eventually, it's getting too thin to hold the water outside off. But it doesn't just gradually slow down. It abruptly slows down and gets thick. That's exactly what happens in the heliosphere. This is the solar wind, supersonic. This is the termination shock of the solar wind. And this is the region beyond where it's thicker. That's called the heliosheath. On the outer edge of the heliosheath is the heliopause, where, in fact, the two different matter, the forms of matter, meet. Uh, the solar matter from inside and the interstellar matter from outside. So you can see this. You can obviously play games with it. You can turn the water on faster. It will grow. The size of the circle grows. You turn the water down a little bit. It shrinks just like what happens with the 11-year cycle. Right in your kitchen sink. It's the best picture I can give you. Okay, now this is a model. This is a theoretical model. This is not a cartoon. This is actually a magnetohydrodynamic model. Gary Zank produced some years ago. Uh, and the colors just tell you temperature. You can see inside, uh, in the yellow region, the wind, which is the direction of the wind, which are the black arrows, the solar perfectly radial, just like in the kitchen sink, until it crosses a boundary called the termination shock. And then, like the water in the kitchen sink, it turns around and goes down the tail, which is the drain, if you like, for all the material. And this boundary between the two is right here. The wind outside, the ionized part, as you can see, is deflected and flows around this way, and it has its own bow shock out in front. You can see the temperature jumps up to about a million degrees uh, from, a, from a much cooler temperature uh, in this thick region. And, of course, it gets denser, about a factor of three to four denser uh, in the, that region than it is in the solar wind just before the shock. Now, this 11-year cycle I've mentioned, and what does that do? Well, this is, again, a magnetohydrodynamic model, not a cartoon, but a real model where uh, Gary Zank has just put in a cyclical variation in the pressure. And you can see uh, that the, this is the termination shock. The inner boundary is where the wind inside that, in the green area, the wind is supersonic. You can see that this is an 11-year period. You can see the shock moving in and out in a very smooth way. Uh, and a small motion out here at the heliopause itself, but the main motion, and it's only about plus or minus 5%. So it's not a large percentage but 5% of 100 astronomical units is a large number. Now, another effect I mentioned to you was blast waves, which get, and this is another MHD model. Uh, this is distance here and time and days. This, this spot you see is a blast wave that started at the sun and propagates out, as you can see, and get, this is the termination shock. And when it gets to the shock, of course, that blast wave pushes the shock out. Uh, you can see it pushes it out. This is uh, 20 AU. It pushes out a few AU, three or four AU. And then after 100 days or so, it comes back in. So the shock perturbs this, the, the, uh, the blast wave perturbs the shock. The shock propagates on through this, this thick ring, if you like, and eventually uh, does a slight slightly perturbs even the boundary between the solar wind and the interstellar wind. But the main effect is at the shock itself. Now, we use that, uh, this, this blast wave, to make an estimate of how far it was out here, uh, out here, because when this blast wave gets to interstellar space, it causes the ions there to vibrate. And some of that vibration is turned into radio waves. And that told, that gave us a way, if you can, if you know when the, when the blast wave started, and we measure that at Earth, and we know when the radio waves occur, if it's about 400 days, it tells us, if we know how fast the blast wave travels, it tells us how big the heliosphere is. And so that was the first real, direct, sort of, 
almost direct, not direct because we weren't actually there, but a fairly a good way to estimate how big this bubble was. And here's the data. Uh, this was Voyager 1. This is 1982, just after Voyager. Voyager flew by, uh, Voyager 1 flew by Saturn in late 1980. And so this was, uh, well, you can see here's 15 AU, Saturn's at 10 AU. So we were at about 17 AU, and suddenly these low frequency, 2,000 hertz, 3,000 hertz, audio frequency radio waves uh, were appeared. And it wasn't immediately obvious what these were. Here was the event at Earth, which was the blast wave coming past. That dip in uh, counting rate in, the, in a neutron monitor said there was a big blast wave. 412 days later, radio emission. And I think Ralph McNutt was the first one to suggest that this was a measure of how far it was out, I think in the case he said, out to the termination shock, but the basic concept that this could be used to estimate the size of this region. Eleven years later, when the sun was active again, another really big blast wave, as you can see by the dip, and 419 days later, radio waves. So that was just one way of estimating the size of the heliosphere. There were a whole set of estimates that were made, used on various kinds of measurements. I'm not going to talk about all of them today. Some involved just knowing what the pressure is inside, balancing an unknown pressure outside. Uh, others had to do with the radio emissions, which is what I just talked about, looking at particles. All I plotted all that data up uh, in 2019. Uh, sorry, that's 2001. Oh, boy. 2001. Plotted it all up, and it all suggested that the shock was somewhere between around 90 AU or so, between 80 and 100. It was very uncertain data, of course. And here is where how much the shock would move in and out as the sun went through its 11-year cycle. So you can see that as the sun became quiet, the, the, uh, toward, as it moved toward solar maximum, then the sun became very active. Shock got pushed back out, came back in, pushed out, come back in. And the prediction was that we would be chasing, surfing the shock in the early 2000s. We would be running along with the shock, but we didn't know exactly where. We could have crossed it earlier or we could have crossed it later. But we were in the phase, it just happened by accident, we were in the phase where the shock was probably moving out about as fast as Voyager, which is an interesting problem. But that doesn't go on forever. Okay. Now, one of the things, one of the key things we were looking for was the particles. Here's the shock. Inside the wind's fast, outside the wind's slow. Particles sort of can get trapped between this fast wind and the slow wind. And like a ping pong ball between a paddle and a table, as you move the paddle down, the ball goes faster and faster and faster. And some small fraction of the ions can get up to 10% the speed of light if they bounce back and forth for a year. That's a very slow process, but it does happen. And this is, in fact, a cartoon just to illustrate what I was just saying. On this side, the solar wind is fast, and these blobs are irregularities in the magnetic field which scatter the ions. So they're, But they're represented as blobs in this cartoon. But just think of them as, as fluctuations of the field which are moving fast on this side and slow on this side, and here's a little ion, a single atom, ionized atom, which is captured, caught in this, uh, in this uh, convergence. You see it's fast on this side, slow on this. If you look at it, it's, of course, it bounces off the slow ones. But if it can manage to get upstream, it can hit a fast one and pick up some energy. And if it can somehow get back upstream and hit another fast one, it gains some more energy. And over a period of a year some fraction of them will actually bounce back and forth enough times to get up to, as I say, about 10% the speed of light. Quite remarkable. So we knew, at least the theory told us, that we should expect particles coming from the shock, ions coming from the shock. So that's the reason... Well, why doesn't this go? There we go. That's the reason back in 2002 there was a lot of excitement. This is the counting rate of, of just low energy particles, low energy ions. And this is the kind of counting rate we've been seeing for years. And suddenly, these are, this is an logarithmic scale. This is a factor of 10, 100, 1,000. Bam! Huge number of particles showed up. And they were there for about seven months, gone away. And then they came back, and they were there again for most of the, another year. 
That certainly suggested that either we had crossed the shock, which was one interpretation, or that in fact we are certainly close to the shock, because this was unlike anything we'd seen before. Well, it turns out we hadn't crossed the shock. Here's that first uh, set of ions, which started in 2002 for about six months. Then something happened. Well, what happened is one of those blast waves came and moved the shock away from the spacecraft, pushed it out, and we sort of got disconnected. And it came back in. Voyager was moving out, and, and the particles came back. But we still hadn't crossed the shock. That happened on December 16th in 2004, right here. You can see a distinct change in the intensity, much larger intensity in these low energy ions than we had seen before and much steadier now, unlike these, which were quite variable, very steady. No question. But that was really a key part of the of the measurement, though, which really told us this time we had crossed the shock was the magnetic field, because these the solar wind carries with it the magnetic field from the sun. And and it, as the as the solar wind spreads out, the field gets weaker and weaker, just like the wind does. But when it goes through the shock, the wind piles up, and so does the magnetic field. And that's exactly what happened. Here's the magnetic field. Don't worry about the units. It's a very, very weak field. But, boom, there it is. It jumped up. And so there's no question we crossed the shock at 94 astronomical units. The Earth is at one astronomical unit. Neptune's at 30. Pluto gets out to 50. So this is well beyond all the planets, even if you count Pluto as a planet. Uh, okay, so what was going on? Why did it take us two and a half years? Well, we can use these. We don't, unfortunately, have a solar wind measurement on Voyager 1. The instrument failed back in 1980 when we flew by Saturn. But we do have on Voyager 2, which is out in the same general region, but not exactly the same. So it's not a perfect measure. But we can use that wind measurement to, to calculate how hard the wind is pressing outward. And this is the, this is the magnetic, uh, magnetohydrodynamic calculation showing the shock being pushed outward by the solar wind intensity. And in the middle of, two, as you can see, in the middle of 2004, the shock started moving back in. Because at that point, the high pressure phase of the sun ended. And rather than, it's almost like the shock crossed the spacecraft rather than we crossed the shock. We were chasing along the shock, basically, starting in the middle of 2002 for about two and a half, uh, two and a half years, and finally, at the beginning of 2005, finally crossed the shock. So, what about Voyager? Here, here it is. So this is the same particle. You can see the intensities. This is that first event we saw in 2002, particles coming upstream from the shock, and then the recovery in another period where the blast wave pushed the shock away and it came back and the particles came back. And then finally, we crossed the shock and there we are in this thick region, the Heliosheath. sheath. The shock was at 94 AU. We began observing these particles upstream of the shock at 85 AU. Voyager 2 began seeing the same ions at 76 AU, closer to the sun than Voyager 1 found them. What could be going on? So this is just taking this data right here and time shifting it to match that data. Not changing intensity, just time shifting it by 2.88 years. And you can see the two are basically seeing the same thing upstream of the wind, except that Voyager 2 saw them much sooner. Uh, they, Voyager 2 saw them at 77 AU and Voyager 1 at 85 AU. What's going on? How, why is, why in the south? Voyager 1, Voyager 2 is down south because it was sent down there when we flew by Triton. Voyager 1 is up north because it was sent there by Saturn when we flew by Saturn and its rings. So there, one's up, one's down. Up here, this seems as though things are further out than they are down in the south. So, let's go back to this plot which shows now on a somewhat longer time scale how the shock moved in as the sun's a pressure dropped after the last solar maximum and it's up, started increasing during the solar maximum being pushed out and it started back in and it's settled in at about 90 AU now is where we think it is right now. 90 astronomical units. Uh, 
We first saw the particles here when the shock was there. So this was the middle of 2002. We started seeing particles when we were probably three to four astronomical units inside the shock still. And as I say, the blast waves moved the shock in and out and moved the shock away. Uh, on Voyager 2, we saw the same particles here at 77 AU. And if you take the same kind of distance, you'd have to say, well, the shock's got to be somewhere in this region right here. It's unlikely that the shock is actually out at 90 AU. It would have to be a lot further away from Voyager 2 than it was away from Voyager 1 when we saw the same particle. So the best guess is that we on Voyager 2 will be crossing the shock any time now uh, in the next year. We just can't say when because it will depend upon what the sun does, whether there's a big blast wave or not. And we're getting little tiny blast waves which are affecting things. And I'll show you that in this plot. This is now the same kind of data, the particle intensity. This is Voyager 1. Here's that first one back in 2002. And then it went away because of a blast wave. And then it came back. And then finally, there's the termination shock. Here is what it looks like on Voyager 2. This is that same intensity that I showed you before. But this is now later data. And you can see a blast wave moved the shock out again. It went away, but it looks like it's come back. So it's come back in. And the question is, when is it going to, when is Voyager 2 going to cross the shock? But in any case, it's likely to be before 94 AU. It's likely to be closer to the sun in the south than the north. So let's go back to the kitchen sink. This is October 2006 in your kitchen sink. There's Voyager 1 and the heliosheath in the thick region. It's been there now since uh, the end of, beginning of 2005, let's say, uh, almost two years. Uh, and it's, uh, it's about, you know, it's probably about 10 astronomical units in, into the heliosheath. One tenth of the size of this ring is how much further it is now. Where's Voyager 1? Voyager 2 is here, just inside at 81 AU. We don't know really how close it is, but it's closer. And the reason I've used the kitchen sink again is because you can see the distance here to the shock is less than the distance there because there's a wall in the sink which has pushed, made the shock non-spherical. What is the wall that's doing that to our heliosphere? If that's what's going on, there's got to be a wall out there. There's got to be some pressure pushing in on the south. Well, the, the most likely pressure comes from an interstellar magnetic field which would have to be inclined like this so it pushes in in the southern hemisphere more than in the northern hemisphere. So if this, if in fact we indeed do find the shock closer in the south, as now suggests we will, we already know something about what's outside in interstellar space. We have an idea of where that magnetic field is and some idea of how strong it has to be to produce this kind of, notice this asymmetry. This is the termination shock. Inside here is the supersonic wind. The green is the heliosheath. The yellow line is the heliopause. You can see how much difference there is in north and south. Now, this is an MHD model. This is not a cartoon. But all these models are very complex and actually do not have all of the right physics in them even yet. And so I would not want to claim that this is an accurate prediction of how much asymmetry there is from north to south. But it's an illustration that, in fact, a magnetic field out there can be like the wall in a kitchen sink and press in preferentially in one hemisphere rather than the other. In any case, sometime in the next 12 months, if this idea is correct, uh, we should cross the shock on Voyager 2. So there, how much farther is it to interstellar space? Well, I, we don't really know because the models are not good enough to tell us to within 10 or 20 percent. But it's on the order of 20 billion kilometers out to the heliopause. On the order. Voyager 1 is now at 15 billion kilometers. Voyager, that's another 10 years. Another 10 years. Only 10 more. It's only been 29 so far. We have enough electrical power, in fact, to last through 2020. Uh, whether the spacecraft will last that long, nobody knows. But we have the electrical power. We're very confident that the power will last. The only question is, will all this electronics, 
all the computers, all the star scanners, all of that continue to work for another 15 years. Well, it's only 50% more than it's done so far. So there's, it's not unreasonable to hope that at least one of them might actually make it. To, they will all both make it to interstellar space. Newton tells us these are the first interstellar probes. The only question is, will they have power to tell us what they're finding when they cross, finally cross out of this bubble and into interstellar space? Our journey continues. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. What an opportunity. Now we can ask somebody who understands the system questions and can also explain it in ways that we maybe have a chance to understand it. Molly is going to turn on the microphone here and we'll be open for questions and I just want her to test it and see if it's working. And I've got some backup because Tom Kermigius, one of the original PIs, is right here in the front row. So if I can answer it, I'll ask him to answer it. All right. <laughs> try, try your mic, Molly. Can you hear me? No. I'm not. Is it on? Am I on? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. All right. Questions? There's one over there to the left, Molly. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to just ask you to ask your name, say your name, Ed, because you, you do know this is recorded. Yes. And what we're hoping and what we plan to do is that not only the material that Ed has um, uh, shared with us right now, but the whole thing is being uh, videotaped. And you will have this on your disk uh, with a link that will give you the information at a later time. Go ahead. Andy. If I don't get stage fright. Pardon? <laughs> if I don't get stage fright. <laughs> well, you won't because you're a brave man. <laughs> My name is Ed Ashford, yeah. uh, semi-retired aerospace engineer. Uh, question. At the distance that it will be at when it finally does reach, quote, interstellar space, and with the transmitters on board, what sort of data rates can you get back, even using the deep space network at that distance? We uh, purposely, one thing which I wanted to do back in 1990 when we finally got onto our interstellar mission was turn the data rate down so we could use the smaller antennas so we didn't have to compete with the other missions to Mars uh, and so that we wouldn't have to change the data rate until the end of the mission. So we run the spacecraft at 160 bits per second. And they transmit 24 hours a day, and we manage to listen to each of them, depending on what other missions are competing for time, uh, about 8 to 10 hours a day. Okay. Another? Okay. I'm Greg Matloff. I teach at New York City College of Technology, yeah. and yeah. I've consulted with uh, NASA yeah. Marshall Space Flight Center, particularly, particularly Les Johnson's group on in-space propulsion. As of course you know, there's been a follow-on study for a number of years for an interstellar heliopause sail, uh, which I've been very happy to have been involved in the work. Do we have a possible date when that's going to move from study to mission? Good. Wonderful. I hope it's going a little faster than Voyager. Voyager goes about a million miles every day, about one and a half million kilometers a day. This system is so large, though, that it would uh, be, be great to have something that moves at least five times faster. The speed will be about five times faster, but do you know of any date which has been set for this mission to become a mission? No. 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 Okay. No. No. Thank you. Other questions? Molly, I think I see one up here. Molly, right there. Hi, I'm David Vivantos from Nanospatio. I want to know, what about the pictures? We don't have any pictures now, but what we, what we can see in any of... Any, any more images? Yeah. No, because uh, we've turned out, we've turned off uh, the, the, all the instruments on the SCAT platform now, except the older Violet instrument. Uh, we took the software off of the, the... These computers, by the way, were designed in the early 70s. Uh, their memories, 8,000 words of memory, right? So we took the software out that was there for the imaging and used it to help run the instruments we're currently running. Uh, we did take one last 
portrait of the solar system in 1990 with Voyager 1, but really we're, we're not close to anything. I mean, space is empty. If you don't, you have to work hard to get close to anything. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Norman Deschamps from the University of Toronto. What I was wondering was the, if you've got a magnetohydrodynamic model of the interstellar wind and how well that ties into the deflection angle that you're seeing from Voyager 1 right now. Well, we know the direction of the interstellar wind, it turns out, because uh, uh, first of all, it was discovered back in the 70s by looking at ultraviolet sunlight being uh, uh, resonantly scattered back. And so you look out in that direction and it's brighter than it is in the other direction because of the backscattering from the hydrogen which is coming in. The Ulysses spacecraft can measure neutral, the neutral helium in the interstellar wind is not affected by any of this. And it flows right into the solar system. Uh, and Ulysses could see exactly where it was coming from. In addition to that, the interstellar helium comes in and is deflected by the sun and is focused behind the Earth. And every year on December 7th, as, a, as the Advanced Composition Explorer goes around the sun, there's a peak in the helium associated with interstellar wind. So we know very accurately where the wind is coming from. Okay, please. I, I'm Dr. Hu from Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, people are very interested for the information on the boundary of the solar system. And uh, you, you show some data from the voyage. And if you can give a uh, data to show what kind of the shock will be, because you have magnetic field and uh, through dynamics, and uh, there are many yeah. kinds of the discovery. Yes, we would certainly like to have data on the shock. Uh, as it turns out that the day we crossed the shock was the only day that year we had no data. Okay? <laughs> on the other hand, even on days when we have data, we have it for only about half the time. So even on Voyager 2, there's a 50-50 chance that we will actually cross the shock when we are receiving data. And that has just to do with the fact of the antennas on the ground. The spacecraft is transmitting. It's just that we won't be in a position to receive the data. So we got our fingers crossed that we will actually measure the shock, but we did not do so in Voyager 1. Hello, my name is Christian. I'm from Norway. Uh, how has uh, solar radiation treated the vehicle? Can you, I can't yeah. speak up a bit. Okay, sorry. Uh, how has solar radiation affected the vehicle, and uh, how, how do you made it last so long? Oh, solar radiation. Well, solar radiation itself, of course, out where we are today, is one ten thousandth of what it is at the sun. So that's not it's not a problem. One of the reasons, besides the radioisotope thermoelectric generators we had a long life, is really I like to thank Jupiter, and by that I mean. We started designing this spacecraft in 1972. Uh, in December 73, Pioneer 10 flew by Jupiter and said, whoops, the radiation environment is a thousand times worse than the models. We took nine months off, went through and hardened, changed the circuits, made them much more robust, uh, because radiation at Jupiter is like rapid aging. So having survived the rapid aging of Jupiter, it means the rest of the mission is just sort of a small additional aging. So that's part of the reason, because we had built it to survive Jupiter. And having done that, we gave it a long life, electronically. Go ahead. Yes. <coughs> My name is Hishinichi Okobori. I'm from Waseda Graduate School of Waseda University. I'd like to know about the new mission to beyond the uh, solar system, if you have. Well, that comment was made. The interstellar probe has been studied a number of times over the years. Uh, it's really a question of finding a new technology which will allow us to get a factor of five, roughly, in speed over Voyager. And when that technology becomes affordable and feasible, I'm hoping, and, and once we know how big the system is, I think clearly Voyager was telling us what, what needs to be done. Voyager instruments, after all, were designed, again, in the 1970s. One could do a lot better today. But it will then, if it's another Voyager, it will take another 30 years for them to get there. We really need to find a way to get there in you know, less than 10 years. Okay. Any, any other questions? 
If not, I, I think I would like to say that you all have been very stoic. This is a warm room, and you put up with some fairly warm conditions here. Uh, but what I'd like to say is that, um, Ed, you've taken us on a fantastic journey, and I think a lot of us are going to be running water in our sinks this evening. Yeah, yeah. So thank you again very much, Ed. <laughs>